Hi everyone, welcome back to Understanding Gradle. This time I want to talk about capability conflicts in dependency resolution. Last time we have explored dependency version conflicts and we have seen that you most likely have to deal with them once your project grows. Capability conflicts are something you most likely will also encounter, but they often go unnoticed and might lead to problems later on. That's why it's important to understand them. So to give you an understanding what capability conflicts are, let's look at an example first. In our example project, I added a dependency to the SLF4J API for logging in several places. I also added a runtime-only dependency to the SLF4J simple binding in the application project. This is only needed at runtime, so it is a runtime-only dependency. You may want to check out my declaring dependencies videos for details on this topic. So now, if I run the app, it will use the simple logger to log to the console. Now I also added a dependency to the drop wizard framework. As this is a larger framework, it brings in several dependencies transitively. If I run my app now, I suddenly get a warning printed that two log bindings are available on the runtime class path. There is a second logback classic binding, which we never defined in our dependencies. Well, as we have learned last time already, frameworks or libraries that are out of our control might bring in anything transitively. So this logback classic binding most likely came with the drop wizard dependency we added. And if we look at the runtime class part of our application, we can see that the logback binding indeed came in transitively via the drop wizard dependency. So obviously there is an issue with our dependencies. Two things ended up on the runtime class path where only one of them is actually allowed. So there are kind of two problems here. The first is that Gradle itself didn't recognize this problem during dependency resolution and we just ended up getting a warning at runtime, which we might also easily miss. Or it might be even worse that this is just there at runtime without a warning and we might get other weird effects that we need to debug. The second thing is that we didn't state anywhere which lock binding we would prefer if multiple are available. Let's look at this step by step. First, in order for Gradle to detect a conflict, it needs the information that two things are in conflict. In the case of a version conflict, Gradle is able to detect the conflict because the group and name coordinates of the module that is in conflict with different versions of itself are always the same, so Gradle knows that these two things are related. What we've seen here is a capability conflict. Capability conflict in Gradle means that different modules provide alternative implementations or solutions for the same thing. In this case, we have two different implementations of the SLF4J API. And in order for Gradle to realize that two modules provide the same capability, the modules need to share this information with Gradle. In this case, the information is missing. To understand that, we can take a look into the repository where the modules we depend on were retrieved from. If we look, for example, at the SLF4J simple module in the Maven Central repository, we see that there are essentially two important files, the jar file, which is the actual code we want, and the POM file, which contains metadata about the module. This POM file, for example, contains the information which transitive dependency the module has. So if we would look at the POM file of the drop wizard framework, for example, we would see a lot of entries there. So unfortunately, the information that a module implements a certain capability cannot be represented in the POM file. The POM format simply doesn't support the capability concept, which is a concept that was added in Gradle 6 and is not supported by any other build tool at the moment. To allow libraries still to publish this additional metadata, Gradle introduced a new metadata format with Gradle 6, the Gradle module metadata format. This allows library to publish information, for example, about their capabilities. Such metadata is still missing for many libraries. We'll get back how to deal with this later in this video. For now, let's just assume the metadata would be there. So to continue with our example, I just made a local copy of the SLF4J simple and the logback modules and added the metadata there and added the local repository to our repositories. So now we have versions of these two libraries available with the metadata that states that these two libraries provide the same capability. Similar to modules, a capability is identified by a group and a name. Here I decided for SLF4J impl as capability name. Our build is now using the version of the modules with the added metadata. 
if we attempt to run our application now, we actually get a capability conflict error. So Gradle is now able to detect that there are two conflicting things on the class path where it needs to choose one. For capability conflicts, there is no default solution in Gradle. So initially, you will always get an error. In the error message, you can see which modules caused the error and why they ended up on your runtime class path. So now we can tell Gradle which module it should choose in case it encounters this conflict. This is done in the resolution strategy. A resolution strategy can be configured individually for each configuration you resolve. But often you can just define the same strategy for all your configurations. In our case, that's what we want. So we define something for all configurations in our convention plugin and there we use the with capability statement stating for which capability we want to express something, which is slf 4 js input. And then using select, we can express which module of the ones that are in conflict should be selected. Note that the select method requires you to define a version, which is often not used. So you can just put a zero here if you don't care. You also have the option here to inspect which candidates Gradle found if you need to make a more informed decision. But often just using select with the coordinates is fine and compact. So if we now run our app, we can see that the warning is gone and it is locked with SLF4J simple because that's what we selected. If we change the selection to lockback classic, we can see that the lock message is formatted slightly different, indicating that a different logger implementation has been used. So different logger implementation is one typical example of capability conflicts. There are other cases which are often much harder to identify because you don't get any warning or message at all. Another example of a capabilities conflicts is a library that changed its coordinates, which for example happened with velocity at some point. When the coordinates change, Gradle doesn't know anymore that the old version is just an older version of the new version which has different coordinates. So both versions might end up on the class path in the end, because Gradle didn't see the conflict, which is like a hidden version conflict actually. And then you can get weird errors because you have the same classes on the class path and it depends on the order of the jars which version is actually used at runtime. Another type of capability conflict you can often see is that this very same thing is packaged several times. For example, there are libraries that are available with transitive dependencies but also in an all package where all transitive dependencies were packaged into the jar of the library, often in shaded packages. If both versions of such a library come into your class path from different directions, Gradle also won't know that these are just the very same things. It might also end up choosing different versions of them when you will get, up, get into the same conflict as I just explained before. So all of these conflicts could be detected by Gradle if these modules would state which capabilities they implement or provide. So as we have seen, the issue is that most of these modules just don't provide this information through their metadata. Hopefully, the situation will improve over the years. Until then, luckily, Gradle provides you with some features to patch the metadata that has missing information. This feature is called Component Metadata Rules and we'll take a look at this now. So in the example, I removed our patch repository again, so we are back to the situation where we miss metadata. Instead of adding the metadata by hand, as we have done for demonstration purposes before, we can now write a so-called component metadata rule that adds this data to the metadata after it was downloaded from the repository. A metadata rule is best written as a separate abstract class in your build logic project. You can then annotate the rule with add cacheable rule and Gradle will cache the result of the rule execution. For that, it's interesting to know that Gradle caches all the metadata it downloads from repositories in an internal format that is very fast to access. And if you write rules, this information is basically modified just after it has been downloaded and the information that ends up in the cache is then the one that has already been modified. So when the dependency resolution engine is running, it looks to the engine as if the metadata was like that in the repository. In the rules, you can actually adjust anything in the metadata, which is also helpful for other things. But adding capability is probably one of the most useful and simple things to do here. So I won't explain all the details of these notations here, but link the corresponding documentation in the GitHub page associated with this video. But what you see here is the most compact way to add a capability to a module. To now use this rule and apply it to both SLF4J Simple and Logback Classic, which both miss this capability in their metadata, we can write a convention plugin 
and use the dependencies.components block to register the rule for the modules I just mentioned. I put it here into a separate convention plugin because this is very basic information we just want to add to all of our build, but of course you can also put it in the convention plugin you already have. In this case, I apply this metadata rules convention plugin in the Java base plugin so that it's automatically applied to all our Java projects. So we could run our build now and see the same results as before where we used the patched versions of the module we have manually added the metadata. That's it about capability conflicts. The difficult thing with this is that at the moment Gradle often doesn't have enough information because the metadata is not rich enough for many modules. So you have to be very careful when looking at your dependency graph which modules are in there and have a look out for these conflicts yourself. If you discover them, it's the best solution to add a component metadata rule to add the missing metadata. You can also use component metadata rules to adjust other details that are wrong in metadata. Using this together with the consistent resolution I talked about last time, you already have enough tools available to get your dependency management also in larger projects under control. Gradle offers a lot of other different alternatives to control dependency resolution and selection of dependencies. Some of these are kind of legacy, which were already there before capabilities and component metadata rules were added to Gradle. My recommendation is to stick with the concept I've shown you as much as you can. Then you have a consistent way to control transitive dependencies and you also have your rules in a central place. As always, there's a GitHub repository associated with this video where you can check out the example yourself. Please consider subscribing to this channel and if there are any questions, please leave a comment. See you next time.